What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to the channel. It's Millennial Trade. So it is election day. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about that towards the end, but I want to focus on the markets, uh, kind of share with you guys what happened with my trade today. It did go well. I was in and out like a bandit. And um, yeah, we're going to try to get this up on time for the, the five o'clock post-market review which is, uh, I think would be a, a cool format. So, and, and guys, thank you for the compliments on the background. You guys seem to, to like the Virginia Beach green screen. So that's good to know. Um, let's go ahead and get into this. Obviously, the midterms are gonna have some kind of effect on the markets. On Instagram today, I basically said that my prediction for this week, you know, for the, the outcome at the end of the week was that the markets weren't really going to move that much at all. There's going to be a lot of volatility both ways, but I think in the end, you know, we're not really going to move much at all. And I said that on Instagram this morning after I was trading and while I was watching the midterm election news. And uh, I didn't know that was going to happen today. I thought the market would at least keep some of the gains. Uh, PayPal made very good gains today, but uh, the fintech companies, they, they they were looking good and then they came right back down, Square and uh, uh, SoFi. And the NASDAQ and the S&P 500 look virtually the same, right? They look virtually the same. And so you could see the market came up and then came right back down. I think we were, we, the futures closed like maybe uh, 0.4% up or something like that, 0.5%. So uh, pretty remarkable, right? Lots of volatility, definitely a lot of opportunities there. We, we kind of just hit supply. I mean, if you go and look at the charts for the NASDAQ and the S&P 500, it, it looks like we came right up, hit some sort of supply area or a new supply zone had formed, right? Maybe there's new sellers out there. And uh, it's all very, very fascinating. I'll talk about my personal trade later on uh, in this video, maybe after we do the political content. Um, so yeah, the effect on the stock market, right? Stocks advance ahead of midterm elections. But again, they were up even more before they came back down. So we'll just have to wait and see. I'm going to be honest, guys. I'm a little um, skeptical of this midterm rally. And I'm even skeptical of the so-called Santa Claus rally. It usually does happen. And especially during midterm years, right? Uh, another headline here uh, from, uh, let's see, uh, the Wall Street Journal, or no, the New York Times. Investors bet on midterm bounce for stock market, right? This is coming from the New York Times. And it says right here under the, the, the headline, stocks usually rise after midterm elections. And I was watching another financial channel. I think it was Jeremy. And he was talking about this like two nights ago. Um, and he showed this you know chart how after midterm election cycles, no matter who wins really, uh, for the la since the 60s, the six month and 12 month, um, you know, uh, trajectories for the stock market have been higher since the sixties. Every single time is it possible? It doesn't happen this time. It's possible. So I, I, I don't want to completely rule it out, even though there does seem to be a consistent, you know, pattern there. So that's what, uh, some investors are betting on, right? This, this, you know, and maybe they're right. Maybe they're right. And this is why I'm long stock. This is why I'm still buying stocks. Uh, we have earnings coming out as well. I'm not going to really talk about it, but at least today, I mean, Walt Disney, you have Occidental Petroleum, uh, Bayer, Nintendo. So, uh, you know, some name brands there, companies everybody will know. Uh, maybe some of these companies you're even invested in. Let me know down below what companies you buy because it helps me gauge what I should be talking about. I could talk about my investments too. You know, I, I love SoFi and I love the vegan companies. I love these dividend stocks, but I want to hear back from you guys what you're holding. I know crypto as well, very popular, but Bitcoin sank, I think, what, uh, under 18,000 today. So again, more compelling prices from the crypto markets. Honestly, I, I wouldn't mind seeing it drop all the way down to like 12K or 10K. I would be very interested in putting a lot of money in it at that point in time. But maybe we'll never get that, right? Uh, let's go back to the uh, the news headlines here. Just a few headlines from 
tradingeconomics.com. Crypto markets wild ride continues. Like I said, yeah, Bitcoin tumbled 15% today. Uh, you have the European stocks up a little bit. Uh, some sort of index came out where it said Americans are more pessimistic, which, you know, yeah, no shit. Um, you have U.S. small business optimism deteriorating. So some of these like indexes where they try to gauge the uh, the business owners and the consumers uh, not looking too good, right? Is it fear propaganda? Who really knows? I'm not afraid, but it's important to pay attention to a lot of this stuff. Now, I found another article from Forbes today. Uh and this was the most interesting one because we, we've got the CPI report coming out on Thursday. This, this is the big event. The CPI numbers, the inflation. This is what, when we get these numbers, we're going to be able to kind of tell uh, how aggressive the Fed could potentially be coming into December's rate hikes. And I talked about the lag effect a couple of days ago. I, I, I think sort of what we're seeing now in the economy could be the effects of two or three rate hikes previously. And it takes weeks, if not months for this stuff to, uh, to really do the damage to the economy. And hopefully, I guess, at least what they say, bring the inflation down. So um, this is from Forbes latest forecast for November CPI inflation could worry Fed. And this article basically goes on to talk about how the Cleveland Fed has a, uh, another metric that they produce on their own before the official CPI numbers come out uh, on Thursday. And uh, so they produced this a, a few days, you know, probably like a week ago now, right? So it's called the Nowcast, the Inflation Nowcast. And this is coming from the Cleveland Fed, the Cleveland Fed independently of, uh, uh, you know, like Jerome Powell's statistics. And they even talk about in this article how it's a it's an, a less official number, but may be more accurate because it's uh, uh, it's called you know the the now cast for a reason. It's trying to gauge inflation right now in the moment, right? So it does these quick surveys. It may not be quite as uh, uh, meticulous, right, as the official numbers, but they expect inflation to come in hot at about 10% year over year. And I think almost 1% month over month. So this is very serious. If this is true, if the Cleveland fed is, uh, uh, and who's that one guy they have from the Cleveland fed. I can't remember his name. I, I think he's from the Cleveland fed. You know, he always comes on and kind of contradicts what Powell is saying a lot of the time. I can't remember the dude's name, but, uh, so yeah, they do this sometimes. They kind of play off of each other, the different uh, uh, Fed presidents, uh, presidents and the banks, right? The the regional banks. One will say one thing, the other will say another. So it's it, it's hard to get caught up in this kind of thing. But uh, I thought that was interesting. The inflation now cast, and yeah, they basically have us coming in hot at like ten percent, ten percent. Uh, they think month over month, it's going to be 0.76%, which is high. Yeah, that's very high. Uh, that's almost 1% uh, increase. So yeah, the, another thing to consider, and um, I have to uh, give credit to the uh, uneducated economist, because this is where I sort of started thinking about this, but he talks about the inflation target, right? And if, for a while, I assumed that the because Jerome Powell is always talking about 2% inflation target. And what um, uneducated economists explains several times, and he really breaks it down. And when you start looking into it, it's absolutely true, right? The inflation target is not 2%. It's a 2% average, which means possibly the Fed could um, allow inflation to run hot for several years because they were supposedly below their 2% average, right? Remember, they kept talking about how they have to hit the 2% average while well, they went way over the 2% average. And um, they're making up, you know, the reason supposedly, right? This is the theory. The reason is that um, they can, they, they need to bring the inflation the 2% inflation target average back up to 2% so they can, you know, keep inflation running hot for a while. Um, so something interesting to think about whenever you hear about the 2% target, it, it's a 2% is not the target. It's the average over a very long time too. You have to consider this. They're thinking about a 2% average 
target inflation rate over maybe decades, maybe 50 years or more. So consider that as well. We might be in this for the long haul. I don't want to dwell too much on the, you know, the financial doom and gloom, but uh, anyways, let's go ahead and get into a little bit of the, some of the funny things I've been seeing out there with the, the midterm elections. There's a lot of cringe, a lot of cringe. Uh, but anyways, the GOP supposedly is leading. And the reasons is because the economy inflation, you know, I I've even seen on CNN where CNN hosts are talking about how uh, the Democrats basically fumbled because they're talking too much about identity, uh, and, and trying to campaign on that. And they, 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 they left the real issues behind, the economy, the inflation, the American standard of living, whatever you want to call it. So uh, hopefully, we'll just see how this turns out. You guys know maybe where I might stand on this, and you might stand on the complete opposite end, and, and, and that's fine. Uh, but I did think it was funny, at least on the Dem side, that um, Fetterman in Pennsylvania running against Dr. Oz, uh, apparently all these um, ballots came in that... Um, should be disqualified because they're not dated, which is very sketchy, right? There's a bunch of ballots in Pennsylvania with no dates on it. And supposedly one of the ballots belonged to the CEO at Comcast. So I'm supposed to believe the CEO at Comcast can't date his ballot correctly? Come on. And anyways, this is what they're trying to sell. And so Fetterman is suing uh, to try to have these disqualified ballots actually not disqualified and counted probably because they're all for him. Uh, and when you watch the mainstream media, MSNBC, CNN, they're talking about how, how we may not get the results immediately, how it may take days, even weeks. I heard on CNN for some of these ballots to be counted. So up to their usual tricks, uh, I, I would have to say, but it's kind of funny. It's entertaining to watch. You know, it's election day in America. Um, how is this going to, uh, how, how's this going to turn out? Uh, we really have no idea. Is it going to be mass chaos? Is it going to be midterm chaos? I think for the markets, especially with all of the inflation and the, the, the rate hikes, there's just so much going on. The instability in the debt markets, uh, I'm open to both sides, and I'm also open to the fact that the market's going to be very choppy, uh, to the idea, I mean, the possibility that the market will be very choppy, just like it was today. My prediction is we're not really going to make a lot of gains or losses by the end of the week, perhaps, uh, you know, by the end of December, right? We might see these huge swings and then these huge pullbacks, and this is just maybe the kind of market we got to deal with. And maybe I'm wrong, right? Maybe we have a V-shaped recovery and we make higher highs in 2023. That would be nice for my you know, long-term portfolio. Um, so that being said, you know, uh, one more piece of cringe too. And I, I made a little uh, Instagram reel guys, follow me on Instagram at millennial trades, same name, same exact name here on YouTube, um, at millennial trades, both here on YouTube and, uh, uh, Instagram trying to get that on Twitter as well. Follow me on Twitter. I'm back on Twitter because of Elon Musk. So, um, we'll see what happens, but Another piece of cringe were these Democrat ads. And you guys just got to look it up for yourself. They, you know, Joe Biden's in them. Kamala Harris is in them. And they're, um, they're basically advertisements or, or TikTok videos. They posted all of these on TikTok. But I mean, it's super, super cringy. And uh, I reacted to one of the Joe Biden ones uh, on my, my, my Instagram. And then we have... Trump and the rivalry potentially between Trump and uh, uh, Ron DeSantis, right? And they're both really big personalities. Trump did vote for Ron DeSantis, but Ron DeSantis a few days ago put out an ad and I think I saw it on Twitter, but it was an ad where uh, there was basically a narrator talking about how God made a fighter, you know, and they're, they're, <laughs> It was kind of, it was over the top. I will be honest. It was over the top because, uh, you know, the way they were sort of portraying Ron DeSantis as this sort of divine hero. For me, it was a little over the top, even if it's true. It was a little over the top and, and a little vain. But that being said, uh, because of that, Trump at a rally, I think in Pennsylvania a few days ago, called Ron DeSantis, Ron DeSanctimonious. <laughs> 
And so there's this like little beef right there. Trump apparently said that he did vote for Ron DeSantis, but said it kind of quietly because, um, you know, we don't know what's going to happen in 2024. There could be some kind of uh, some kind of political, uh, uh, you know, they need to duke it out right between the two of them for who's going to get the nomination. And that would be entertaining to watch regardless. So, and I forgot to talk about my trade. So let's go ahead and do that. Um, basically I traded PayPal because I, I told you guys this a week ago. I kind of, I lost a lot of money on PayPal this past year and last year after I was up big. And so I'm sort of revenge trading PayPal. I want to get all my money back and then some, I don't have to get everything I made last year, but I want to get some back on PayPal uh, before I get serious about trading Amazon more consistently or some of these other, and, and I follow the FinTech, right? So if I'm not trading PayPal, it's usually Square, maybe SoFi. And uh, so that's why I trade PayPal all the time. But I made almost $500 today. I think it came out to like 465 or something like that. It was a 15% gain in the account and I didn't take anything out of it from yesterday. So I was up like 14% yesterday. Today I'm up like over 15%. And uh, it was a quick trade too. I mean, I'm telling you guys, I am running this game like, like, like a bandit. Okay. It, it's like, I'm trying to hold up the bank and get the fuck out. And so I got in at 931. I had trouble getting in. I was trying to get in at 930, right? And the price of the option just kept going up and up. I was waiting for it to come down and it wouldn't, and I couldn't get filled at where I was trying to get filled at. And so uh, I bought these contracts at like 175 and I, I was in at like 931 and bam, by 932, literally a minute later, um, I took them all off and I was up, you know, about $500. So that's a great way to start the week yesterday and today. And, and this is how I'm trying to do it. Just one and done. I love this style. This is kind of what suits me because, um, if I'm going to sit there and start trading more after that, it's just, it's not worth it, but it is, uh, uh, it's nerve wracking even for a few moments there. Right. I left a lot of money on the table. Don't get me wrong. Right. PayPal had a huge run. I was buying calls and PayPal had a huge run today, pulled back, gave a lot of it back, but filled the gap. And then some that from, I don't know, maybe like four or five days ago when I had the huge down move from like 90 and, uh, yeah, I, you have to leave money on the table sometimes because the other thing is too, you could sit there and watch it and make, you know, thousands and thousands of dollars, but it could also turn against you because PayPal went all the way up and it's, you can't pick the tops. You could have picked a top anywhere and always had left money on the table. Right. And by the time it pulled back, uh, a lot of people would have gotten destroyed. My contracts were still the ones that I sold this morning. I went and checked. Uh, I sold them at like, I don't know, maybe 220, 225, and they were at 345. So they were still, even with the, the huge pullback, it was still higher than where I had sold out early this morning. But that's okay because I, I'm trying to go for these one and dones. I want to get in and out and enjoy the rest of my day. So uh, that's what I'm focusing on. Uh, I think it's a decent strategy as well as having some long-term swing trades and, you know, maybe a couple of December calls or puts open here and there. Uh, that's kind of what I'm trying to do and get as much cash in the account as I possibly can. So I don't want to take up all of your guys' time, but thank you for watching the video. Please do give it a thumbs up, comment down below, follow me on Instagram, and I'll see you guys next time.